thinking about India and the work of missionary uh, Venki and his wife Shami. Uh, do be praying for them uh, as they're working in India. They're also seeking to use their family as much as they can as a witness for Christ there. I do pray that the Lord would grant uh, both wisdom to Venki and Shami as they, as they seek to minister to their own children, but also as Venki seeks also to reach the lost in India. For ourselves, uh, do be praying for the letter Kenny work as well. I ask that the Lord would bless that, not only adding to their number, um, but of course also adding that the Lord would raise up ruling elders and deacons too. And then for ourselves, uh, do remember our Lord's Day services. Um, pray that the Lord would visit us in his mercy, uh, Lord's Day after Lord's Day. Also this Lord's Day, do remember that um, we are resuming our Sabbath school. So pray that the Lord would bless that, both the instructors and also those who will be uh, taught. Also do be praying as well for the CY, um, as they'll be resuming soon as well. As we look forward to in this autumn, uh, looking toward covenant renewal and elections, of course, do remember those things. And then also, finally, uh, be praying that the Lord would help us um, to reach those who are in this village. Um, our calling here is to be, well, to press the interests of Christ wherever he's called us. And so the village should never be far from us. And we do, we do ask that the Lord would open up doors. Um, and see that this place, too, be transformed for Christ. Keeping those things in mind, let's turn now to the worship of our God. But first of all, turning in our Psalters to Psalm 96. Psalm 96. Oh, sing a new song to the Lord. Sing all the earth to God. To God sing, bless his name, show still his saving health abroad. Among the heathen nations his glory do declare, and unto all the people show his works that wondrous are. For great is the Lord, and greatly he is to be magnified. Yea, worthy to be feared is he above all gods beside. For all the gods are idols dumb, which blinded nations fear. But our God is the Lord, by whom the heavens created were. Great honor is before his face, and majesty divine. Strength is within his holy place, and there doth beauty shine. Do ye ascribe unto the Lord of people every tribe. Glory do ye unto the Lord, in mighty power ascribe. Amen. To the praise of our God, we take up these words. Psalm 96, verses 1 to 7. We'll stand to praise God. I'd ask Mr. Billy Williamson if you'd lead us in prayer after we sing. Let's stand to praise God. Sing a new song to the
Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Calvary. We thank you, Lord God, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. That guilty hell deserves, guilty hell deserving sinners are saved by grace. And by grace are you saved through faith, and that none of yourself that is a gift of God. O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of salvation by grace alone, Lord God. And Lord God, we do thank you for your word, Lord God, for thou art the word. We thank you for those men who a hundred years ago, men who were persecuted and martyred, so that we would have your word in our own language. Oh Lord God, we do thank you for that, Lord God. And Lord God, we pray that the Trinitarian Bible Society, as they translate your word into the language of the nations who are trying to live from the four corners of the earth, that that word will go forward, Lord God. And Lord, but your word will not return unto you for it. Heavenly Father, if we come before you, Lord, we pray for our own land, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for the work that you are doing in the Reformed Baptist Church at Arm. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for the good news that that church is growing, Lord God. But Lord God, we pray as it grows, Lord, you will protect them from the evil one, out to destroy them. But Lord God, we know that the gates of hell shall never prevail against your church, that your work will be done in Dublin and in the south of Ireland, Lord God. And those who should be saved will be saved, and add it to your church. We pray for all those other people, Lord God, in the south of Ireland. Pray for like Desmond Smith, out in O'Connell Street, three, four days a week, Lord God, preaching your word. Lord God, be with that man. Bless him, Lord God. We just pray, Lord God. That through the witness, Lord God, that the Holy Spirit would cause anxious thoughts in the people who hear it, Lord God, and lives would be saved. We pray for that work in the south of Ireland, Lord. We thank you for the good news of what is happening. And Lord God, we pray for our own land, a land riven just with sin, Lord God. Lord God, Solomon, LBGT, Lord God, murdering the wee child in the womb. Lord God, what does it come to? And Lord God, we know that unless you interfere, Lord God, and take control of it, Lord God, nothing will happen. Lord God, we commit it to you. We know all is according to thy will, and all according to thy divine promise, Lord God. And in all that there, Lord God, your will will be done. And help us not to get down, Lord, but to come to you in prayer, praying for a reformation in the churches in this land and the land of England, Scotland and Wales. Lord, pray for a reformation and pray for a revival among the people that lives would be saved by grace. We thank you, Lord, for the witness of the Reverend Joey in North Britain, Lord God. We commit that family to you, Lord. We commit Joey and Monica and Rannick and Isabel and Marion and we go through. We commit that family to you, Lord. We thank you for the witness that he is coming in our own and our land and in our area, Lord God. Lord, we commit him to you, Lord. We pray as we're writing about these areas, Lord God, that you would prepare the path and prepare people to talk to us and discuss us, Lord, and to be able to take the track, Lord God. Those who you want to, we just commit that all to you, Lord God. Pray for the children in this congregation. Pray for the infants, Lord God. We thank you for the birth of a wee boy in the Silverside family, Lord. We pray for that wee boy, Lord. We pray for Peter and Emily. And Lord God, we pray for all the other children, the children who go to Sabbath school, Lord. Pray for the older children. Pray for those who are heading back to university. Pray for those that are doing their ends, Lord God. We commit them all to you, praying, Lord God, that you would protect them and I will be done in their life and all those children that be saved by grace early in life, Lord God. Heavenly Father, be with the congregation, be with those that are in the Lord. We think of Rosemary, Lord, and Tommy and the Powers, Lord God, and Ida Grafton, Lord God, 
Jail fellows, Lord God, we commit them all to you, Lord. Pray you will comfort them and be with them. We pray, Lord God, and you will comfort them as they set about the house, Lord. Be with them, give your loving hand upon them. Pray that we will grow in grace with you, Lord. Pray for the congregation as we worship you. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth. To give you all the praise, to give you all the glory, Lord God. That we can come to a congregation where the word of God is soundly preached, Lord God, and where a minister really wants to see people saved, Lord, and is preaching sound doctrine. We pray for those in the congregation who are not saved, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that the Holy Spirit will work in their lives as they hear the word preached, and Lord God, that they will be saved by grace. Pray for those, Lord God, with long COVID, Lord God. Pray for Jill Boy, pray for Heather, Lord God. And we pray for the McGee family over in England, Lord. Pray for John McGee that you would be with them and have them be restored back to more health, Lord God. Pray for Angela and the children, Lord. Be with them, comfort them, and be with them. And bless our family home, Lord God. Lord God, we just pray that you would hear our prayers, Lord God. Forgive us all our sins. And this we pray in the name of your only begotten Son, our Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Epistle to the Romans, chapter 1. And we'll begin our reading there at verse 17. Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18, rather. Hear once again the word of our God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools." And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And then down just a few lines, chapter 2, and we pick up there, verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. 
For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Thus far, the reading of God's word, and may he bless it to us this evening. I'd ask Mr. Stephen Boyd if he'd lead us in prayer this evening. Let's stand to go to the throne of grace together. Help 
Book of Jonah, chapter 1. And we will begin there at verse 1. That's Jonah, chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Here once again, God's word. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down again into it to go with them into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us, and we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am in Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he told them. Then they said unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought, and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it into the land, but they could not. For the sea wrought, and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord. And made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Amen. Thus far the reading of God's word, and may he bless it to us tonight. We said last midweek that this is a book that is not a reply to racism or nationalism, 
This is not an instruction manual on vocations or even on evangelism. Very, very simply, the book of Jonah is a primer on grace. But really, as we come into our text this evening, which is verses 4 to 16, we find the lesson doesn't begin in the verdant hill country of Judah. It doesn't begin really at the temple ground where you had all the means of grace surrounding the prophet. No, the real lesson begins at verse 4. The first three verses are about the man's sin. But verse 4, everything begins to change. We've exchanged the, the ruling and the green hills of Judah for the roiling, the turbid seas of the Mediterranean. We're now looking at a storm that is sent out specifically by God. And friend, you can picture this easily. There's a ship that left Joppa without any problem. And all of a sudden the storm comes and the sea begins to heave. And the ship has found itself in the middle of a vast sea and it's like to break under the waves. Like to break through the wind. You can see the frothing waves, the snow-capped mountains that the ship is climbing, being tossed about to and fro. As you're watching this, you can see, of course, the mariners doing what they only know best to do, and that is to lighten the load as best they can. And so they endeavor to use their seamanship to pull them out from the storm. But the text is very clear. The more that they did this, the more the storm heaved. The more the wind blew, the more the mist cut, the more the sea raged. The point of the text is so very clear. No matter what these mariners are doing, they cannot get out. The point of this text at this moment here is that God has sent a storm and none can stay the hand of this God. The mariner's seamanship does them no good. And so they continue to row, and they continue to throw things off, and, and they continue to save the ship as best they know how, and it becomes, we, we don't know when and we don't know how, but it becomes very evident to them that this is all futile. That's the text that you have here in verse 4. The ship is going to break, and they're going to die. Every wave pushes them on the brink of eternity. Every, every blast of the wind threatens their demise. And this is the point, friend, in which the lesson begins. What's striking about this text is there's this moment. We, we don't know how it begins, but a moment in which the mariners not only come to the realization that the ship is going to be broken, but they realize something else. They see something through the waves, and they see something through the mist, and through the frowning clouds. They see something there that tells them that the one who rules the waves and the wind is the one who sent this. Do you note that? These are mariners, experienced seamen. And all of a sudden they come to the conclusion, not only is the ship going to break, but they need to placate deity. They need to approach the one who is God over the wind and over the waves. The God who is the God of land and of sea. They come to this conclusion, it's a striking one, isn't it? They come to this conclusion that these frothing waves are not simply happenstance. But these things are controlled by some divine power. They come to that conclusion, and so what do they do? Well, these men, under the dim light of nature, they throw themselves before their false gods, and they seek some kind of divine deliverance. But in the backdrop is our prophet. He comes, apparently, as you're looking in the original, he comes apparently above deck in verse 5, only to return at the end of the verse to go to sleep. A friend, that word, you ought to understand, that word that concludes verse 5 is not the idea that we often have associated with this part of the story. Jonah doesn't go down to the belly of the ship because he's tired. This word fast asleep is a word that's used to describe somebody who has fainted from, from extreme fear. And so that's the way Daniel uses it. He says, when the angel was speaking with him, I was in a deep sleep on my face to the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. He had fainted, the angel pulls him to his feet again. Again, in chapter 10 of Daniel, he says this, I heard the voice of his words, the angel, and when I heard the voice of his words, then I was on a deep sleep on my face, my face toward the ground. He fell as dead, like John on Patmos. 
That's the idea behind Jonah in verse 5. He sees also, like the pagan mariners, he sees through the waves, he sees through the frothing sea, that there is a God who is angry. And it's not the pagan deities invoked by the mariners, it is Jehovah. And so what does he do? Friend, this is a striking thing. He goes to the bottom of the ship and faints. He's stricken by the thought that God is now pursuing him. He fled from the presence of God, but God was not letting go of him. He was seeking him even in the waves and the wind. But friend, as we look through this text, what you have is in the midst of all of this frenzy, a very clear picture that the text has transitioned. We're no longer dealing with a prophet of the first three verses. The primary focus now becomes the mariners on the ship. These supplicating, praying, sacrificing mariners who are entirely dimmed, as it were, from the light of the true God, they become the focus because as you look through the next several lines, all that you have really are their words, their actions, their experiences, and Jonah becomes a secondary character. What focuses the narrator's attention and what's supposed to focus our attention is how these ones respond to this manifest manifest picture of divine power and anger. I mean, friend, I want you to notice in verse 6, they are the ones who call upon God. And note, they call upon God, they don't faint. There is some sense that there may be some hope that they could placate whatever deity really controls the waves. And then you come down to verse 14. Then they call upon God for mercy. Once they learn who the true God is, notice verse 14, they invoke his name, they call upon him for mercy, they even acknowledge divine sovereignty. And then in verse 16, once they're delivered, note what they do. They fall upon their knees back to the Lord, they sacrifice to the true God and make vows to the true God, manifestly abandoning their idols. Friend, what's striking about this text is the fact that Jonah is very clearly only in the background. Jonah is invited to make a confession. In fact, he's invited to explain why he's fallen. And note what he says here. It's a striking thing. In verse 10, they ask Jonah, why hast thou done this? And the narrator doesn't give us a reply. Jonah goes mute. What's also striking here is that of all of the people praying in Jonah chapter 1, Jonah is not one of them. And what's also striking in this text is the storm came not because of these pagan people who were so willing to sacrifice to false gods. As Jonah himself says, this storm came because of him. It's a striking thing, isn't it? These pagan mariners seem to be pictures of devotion and supplication and the Israelite on board, the only Israelite in the entire story, is the one who will not confess, will not pray, and is the one who is fleeing God's presence. What we can't miss, friend, at this stage is that you have a very clear picture, a picture that's going to pervade really all four chapters of Jonah, but one that we can't miss even here. And that is that these mariners, only operating through the light of nature, are shaming a man who ever lived under the light of Scripture. These mariners become a picture of devotion and of quick repentance and willing to go back to God and to vow and to sacrifice to God. And the Israelite in our story is the one who's fleeing the altar of God, fleeing the temple, and wants nothing to do with the presence of God. What they're doing with the little light of nature that they have and the little revelation that they've received from the prophet Jonah has done far less with. The light of nature in this case shames those who are impenitent, who misuse the light of Scripture. And I want us to consider that under three headings then this evening. First of all, I want us to see how the light of nature urges them to respond specifically to wrath, how it urges them to respond specifically to sin, and then how it urges them to respond to deliverance. And so first of all, friend, How does the light of nature urge these mariners, who again are living lives in paganism up to this point, how does it urge them to respond to this manifest token of divine wrath? Well, friend, I want you to notice that these men are not atheists. There was a flicker, a thought that comes upon them, that this storm is something else. 
or, or maybe not even that this storm is unique. It's just the acknowledgement that he who rules the wind and the waves is there in that moment. They recognize they live in the presence of divine power. They're not atheists. The light of nature told them that there was one divine power that ruled the wind and ruled the waves, and maybe they were of the Athenian faith. Maybe they knew that there was this unknown God to them that ruled over all things, and perhaps it was he who sent the storm. We don't know that, but perhaps that's the case. At least the Athenians were of that mind. But here, friend, the light of nature told them that there was a God who ruled over the wind that was beating their ship who ruled over the waves that was like to crush them and to throw them into death. They had that much knowledge. And they also acknowledged this, friend. It's a striking thing. But as they begin to placate their false gods, as they begin to supplicate for some kind of divine deliverance, what's striking is they immediately come to the conclusion that this divine power who rules all is offended. In other words, friend, they live in a world in which evil is despised by the one who, who controls all things. They knew that much. And so they cast lots. The light of nature told them that he who has created all, at least, is a God who despises sin. And then finally, friend, what you find in this text is they also invoke whatever gods they can think of What's striking about that, friend, is they have this conviction that that perhaps is a way of deliverance. Perhaps he who has created all things, who has demonstrated his goodness, as we'll see in a moment, perhaps he also will have mercy. The light of nature teaches this, friend, then. The light of nature teaches both sin's consequences and divine goodness. I mean, friend, the scriptures teach us this much. They teach us that the light of nature shows the shamefulness of sin. Remember Paul as he talks to the church at Corinth. It is reported commonly among you that there is fornication. And such fornication, he writes, is not so much as named among the Gentiles. Then, 1 Corinthians 11, he goes on to write this. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? How does this concept of shame come? Well, friend, it comes from that idea that we read in Romans 2 in which the apostle says that the Gentiles show the work of the law written in their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. The idea that the apostle is saying there is that in the light of nature, there is still this idea that sin is seen to be sin. Sin is seen to be evil. Yes, the light of nature is murky, but even the mariners understood this much. If one offends deity... If one sins, it's a shameful thing. But friend, it's not even just the shame. As the apostle writes to us again in Romans chapter 1 now, note what he says about these who only had the light of nature, not the light of scripture. He says, they knowing the judgment of God, they knowing the judgment of God, and that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Do you see what the apostle is saying there? He's saying the light of nature not only shows them the shamefulness of sin, but it even shows them that the judgment of God is coming. It shows them that those who commit sin are worthy of death. That's what the apostle Paul says, Romans 1.32. The light of nature teaches that much. And the mariners learned the lesson. They could see in the wind and in the waves that God was angry. Whatever name they might call him by, God was angry. And because he was angry, it must manifestly be because there was sin on board. Now friend, what's striking about this text is they also, in all of their dimness that they have, they still have this hope, as we've said before, that there is some kind of deliverance possible. The Apostle Paul, when he's on shipwrecked, speaks to pagans this way. Nevertheless, God left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Turretin goes on to write about that particular text to tell us that even the heathen through the light of nature can discern this much, that because God is so good, perhaps he will also show mercy. No, the light of nature is insufficient to show us Christ. But it can at least give the man this hope that maybe he who rules over all things will be merciful to those who supplicate. The light of nature teaches that, but friend, I want you to notice there's a real contrast in this text. 
And of course, it's back with Jonah. I want you to notice the rebellion. When the Lord comes to the people of Israel, he asks this. He says this, rather. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Friend, which one here on the deck appears most irrational? Jonah knows the true God. He knows the law of God. And yet he is like the ox that does not know his master's crib. He simply does not act like one who has lived under the light of the knowledge of God. Irrational. And then on top of that, friend, even though he has all of the testimonies of Scripture that show God's goodness, Jonah faints instead of prays. He goes below deck instead of supplicating the true God. They call him to pray. He he remains mute. Friend, it reminds you, doesn't it, of the people of Israel. They said, there is no hope, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone, Thou hast brought me forth, for they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. In vain have I smitten your children, the Lord says. They have received no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a, like a destroying lion. You see what the prophet Jeremiah is saying there. You have grown so despondent, you don't trust in the goodness of God, you won't repent. You have no interest in actually lodging yourself in faith upon Jehovah. You remember how the writer of Hebrews describes for us what faith is. Without faith, he writes, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Yes, that Jehovah is. But note this, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Which one on the deck in Jonah 1 really looks like the one who is possessing some faith? Who is the one that actually looks like they trust in divine goodness? Strikingly, friend, it's not the only Israelite in our text. It's not Jonah. Instead of praying, he faints. Instead of seeking God, friend, he remains mute. What does this teach us? Well, friend, it teaches us, first of all, that we are to despise our sin, sins committed in the light of Scripture, more than we despise the sins of those committed in the darkness that are without the enlightenment of Scripture. Friend, how culpable is Jonah at this moment? These mariners seem to have some, some knowledge of God, at least in their behavior, that Jonah seems somehow to lack. Jonah refuses to do the very most natural things that even the heathens are engaged in, though they're doing so wrongly. Jonah, who knows the true God, nevertheless acts like, more like a stone, more like a brute beast than he does a man. Friend, what of us? Oh, we look at the world and we look at the sins that are committed by those who lack the light of the gospel. And we lament that such sin is committed by men. But friend, have you thought much? Have you thought much about the idea that your sin and my sin as we commit them under the light of Scripture, friend, shows us that we are even all the more culpable. Our sins all the more heinous. To whom much is given, much is required. But friend, that brings us to our second point. What does the light of nature teach us in response to sin? I want you to notice here that the sailors immediately fall in verse 7 to cast lots. Uh, This could lead to a digression, but you notice here that the light of nature teaches this much. That the use of lots and lot casting is not for recreational purposes, it's for very specific religious purposes. Um, And this is not just for pagans, this is all throughout Old and New Testaments. The light of nature teaches us that much. Because they're invoking the one who rules the lot, the God of providence. And so what are they doing? They're seeking through the lot to find out the sin that's among them. What's striking, friend, is once they find the sin, as we already read in verse 10, they're the ones who issue the rebuke. 
Those who had only the light of nature, note what they say to the prophet who has the light of scripture. Why hast thou done this? And Jonah remains silent. The light of nature accuses sin. Even in its dimness, even in its murkiness, even these mariners could see Jonah was inexcusable. And finally, friend, it's a striking thing in this text, but as you come to verse 14, not only do they accuse sin, find it inexcusable as they do in verse 10, but in verse 14, know what the mariners do. They're afraid of contracting more guilt. The light of nature teaches them this much. They don't want to contract any further guilt. Sin is something now that they're seeing, is something that's to be shunned, not to be indulged in. What does this teach us? Oh, friend, it teaches us, even nature teaches us, that a man must repent. Though it can't teach them that faith in Christ will save, it teaches them this much, that man must flee from sin. And friend, I want you to notice, that's what the apostle argues for the Corinthian church. When he writes to the church in Corinth, and he says in the fifth chapter, that even the Gentiles aren't doing what you're boasting in. He's saying that even the Gentiles would find this thing something that ought to be avoided. Even a light of nature told the Gentiles in Corinth that what you're doing in the churches is absolutely reprehensible. Even the light of nature would tell a man to shun sin. And you see, friend, that's the idea again that you have in Romans 2. When the heir of the apostle says that the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. He's not talking about a true and a meritorious righteousness. He's talking about a civic righteousness. The sense that as much as they possibly can, the law teaches them this much. They should avoid sin. They should avoid it at all costs. To the point where he goes on again to say that their conscience also bearing witness that their thoughts, the meanwhile, either accusing or excusing one another. Even the light of nature teaches a pagan that you need to walk more on the side of those things that would not accuse you before conscience and the idea being mainly before God. And then contrast that with Jonah just for a moment. It's a striking thing. When you come to our text... In verse 6, Jonah's commanded to do something that he was commanded to do in verse 2. To arise. The mariners, the ship master rather says, Arise, call upon thy God. And not once do we find Jonah praying. Then, again, the mariners raise in verse 10 that question, Why hast thou done this? And again, Jonah remains Mute. You see, friend, Israel and Jonah are not too unlike each other here. The prophet writes in Isaiah 22, In that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth, and behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. You see, friend, it's a striking thing in chapter 1 of Jonah's prophecy. That in this text, you have pagans who are afraid of contracting guilt. Pagans who are accusing sin and leaving it inexcusable. And yet, again, the only Israelite on board is mute, prayerless, and is the cause of this wrath. It's a striking thing, isn't it? But friend, what does this teach us? It teaches us this much, that even according to the light of nature, friend, sin is something that is ugly, it is something that is detestable, it is something that ought to be spurned. If I could put it this way, friend, the scriptures teach us, and even nature itself teaches us, that sin is not normal, even if it's common. Sin is not normal, even if it's common. It dehumanizes, it malforms. It does not make us more man or more woman. Even the light of nature teaches us that much. And yes, friend, because of our depravity, even the pagans will run into those things that they know are ugly and heinous in themselves. But the point is, the light of nature still holds out this much. Your sin and my sin are things that are not normal. They are reprehensible. They are unnatural. 
Friend, there are things that are ugly and there are things that deform. They disable. The idea is, is very similar to what you would have in the natural realm. When you look at a bird who should fly but can't, when you look at a creature that is clearly malformed by some other thing, friend, you see that thing as it's clearly amiss. Something's wrong. Well, friend, when you see man in sin, you are supposed to understand that the light of nature, and especially the light of Scripture, scripture tells you that sin is not to be present. It is ugly. It is dehumanizing. And friend, the mariners, at least in chapter 1, have that much knowledge. It's something that's detestable. Something that leaves a man without excuse and something they want to stay clear from as you have in verse 14. Oh, but friend, as you think about this ourselves, think about that moment when the mariners find out that Jonah is a prophet of the Most High God. Oh, decades of sin and decades of idolatry. They were in darkness without any knowledge of Jehovah. They continued to worship stocks and they continued to worship stones. They continued to worship the creature instead of the creator. For decades and for decades this was so. And then suddenly on the ship deck, suddenly they find that there's a prophet of the Most High God. The God who rules land and who rules sea. And then they find out that he flees from God. Friend, can you imagine that question and how heavy laden that question would be with meaning? Why? Why hast thou done that? We, who were pagans from birth and in a land of darkness, we certainly didn't serve God. But we had no knowledge of Him. His word was not lodged with us. It makes sense that we would worship stocks and stones. But you who were raised under the light of Scripture, who had the means of grace, who knew Jehovah, and who prayed to Him. Why would you flee His ordinances? Why would you deliberately disobey Him? Friend, that's the idea behind chapter 1, verse 10. That's the idea behind the question. Why, they ask, hast thou done this? You who know the true God, why would you rebel? Oh, and friend, that really ought to lay us all bare. How many in hell who were out without Scripture today could rise up and ask us the same question? You who sinned this morning, though you knew what you were doing, friend, have you thought about the countless millions who were without Scripture's light who could stand in hell and argue that you are the worst sinner of them all. Not only were you lost and undone in Adam, and not only did you def defy the light of nature, but you defied the light of Scripture. After God had been so merciful as to lodge His word among you. Why, asked the mariner, hast thou done this? Because sin is, by nature and by Scripture's light, detestable and ugly. That leads us to our third and our final point. What does the light of nature teach? Now coalescing with the light of Scripture or Revelation with regard to deliverance. And friend, here you have in verse 16 the focus not on Jonah. Verse 16 shows us that the focus is no longer on the errant prophet. The focus is on the mariners at this moment. At verse 17, Jonah will resurface. But in verse 16, you have the, you have the mariners' responses. They're vowing and they're paying to the Lord. You know what's striking, friend? If you hold this verse in light of what you have in verses th verse 3, the beginning and end of verse 3, where Jonah's fleeing the presence of God, the ordinances of God. He's fleeing those things that God had ordained that were the right context for sacrificing and for vows. Now the mariners are doing the very thing that Jonah fled from. And not fleeing to their idols, but fleeing to Jehovah. And not fleeing to Jehovah simply because they desire mercy. They've already received mercy. They're going to God out of thanksgiving. Friend, as we close, what you have in this text is a picture 
of how the scriptures show us the right response to deliverance and how even a pagan with very little light of scripture now can make great use of what the Lord gives. In this moment, friend, you have a band of heathens, mountains, decades of sin. They've lived in darkness, and as the Apostle writes in Romans 1, they've even delighted in it. And now suddenly, by the grace of God, they rejoice in Jehovah who saves. Now, friend, nature's light and scripture's light say the same thing. That ought to fill a man with praise and rejoicing. It's a striking thing in this text. But I said at the very onset that this is a book about the grace of God. This is a primer about the grace of God. And friend, the striking thing is, here are the mariners because they have fled to the Lord. Know that grace. Even though there were mountains of sin, years upon years of rebellion, Ages of darkness. They found the Lord was merciful and was gracious to whoever would come to him in repentance and faith. It's a primer in grace, friend, because it shows us something that's so very basic. The mariners experienced and knew this grace in ways that Jonah's Israel didn't. Have you thought about that? Behind this whole book stands an unrepentant Israel whom God has promised to remove the word from if they remain in rebellion, whom God is going to convert the Ninevites to show that if the word of God goes from them and converts others, it's a demonstration that Israel has been left in judgment, not because God is impotent. No, friend, what the text tells us here in an implicit way is that in order for you really to know the grace of God aright, you can't be like Israel, and you can't be like Jonah in our text. You must flee to the mercy that is offered. If you are going to be those who take hold of Jehovah and know what his grace actually is, you must take hold of it as it is offered to you in Christ. Friend, we don't know exactly all of the conversations that were had on that ship deck. And it's not our place to speculate. But the mariners knew this much. They had received mercy from the God of gods. And now they owed him their lives. Sacrificing and vows were simply emblems of lives now required to be lived in thanksgiving. Because they knew grace. Calvin tells us that this whole book, the full four chapters of Jonah, are really about one thing. Their purpose is not to teach us about racism or nationalism. Their purpose is not to teach us about vocation and certainly nothing to do with the big fish, really. The purpose is to show Israel in Jonah's day what repentance really is. In other words, friend, to show those who sit under the light of Scripture day in and day out what sin is, and the only way to know what grace is. And that is by repentance and by faith. Calvin says this is to stir them up to jealousy when they see Nineveh converted. Why? Because they're supposed to see their own stupidity, their foolishness, and not only transgressing the light of nature, but even transgressing the light of Scripture. God willing, next week we'll take up verses 16 again and also verse 17. As we, continue, as we continue to look at this book, as it shows us the grace of God. Amen. We'll respond to God's word by taking up our psalters and turning to Psalm 80. Psalm 80. And here are just verses 11 to 16.
Upon the one hand to the sea, her bows she did send out, she did outsend. On the other side, under the flood, her branches did extend. Why hast thou then thus broken down and taken her hedge away, so that all passengers do pluck and make of her a prey? The boar who from the forest comes doth waste it at his pleasure. The wild beast of the field also devours it out of measure. O God of hosts, we thee beseech. Return now unto thine. Look down from heaven in love. Behold, and visit this thy vine. You see, friend, this is what Israel should have prayed. And in a sense, this is what the mariners did pray. And friend, they found that the Lord was merciful and gracious. May we pray even as we sing. Psalm 80, verses 11, here to 14. And then I'll ask uh, Mr. Billy Kemps if he'd close us in prayer. Psalm 80, verses 11 to 14. And we'll stand to praise God.
where we have seen that sin once again. O oh Lord, we have not done as we have all begun this day. We have sinned against you in so many ways. Our words, our thoughts, our actions. Father, we seem to be aware tonight how these mariners saw in me being in the light of nature. And Father, as the waves build over the group, you turn them all to yourself. And yet Jonah was quiet, speechless, dumb. And Father, how often we are just as guilty as Jonah. Lord, when we should speak, we are quiet and we are dumb. So I thought you would come for me this night. Lord, we ask for forgiveness of our sins and our failures. And we ask for God that you would help us to be witnesses for thee. Even in the midst of the storm, guide our thoughts and our minds and our hearts towards thee. Lord, when opportunities come, and all that comes to us, we do is what we show them to speak for thee. Help us, Lord, to remember what we have heard this night from Scripture, from thy servant. Help us to remember, O God, that we are not to be done, that we are not to be silent. But rather, Lord, we are very bold and mighty witnesses for thee. Lord, help us. Continue to teach us from your word. We thank you for your servant who brought that word to us this evening. We thank you, Lord, for that precious time spent in the study, preparing what we have heard this evening. We thank you for that time, Lord. We thank you for being with you. And we pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with the night and the days ahead. And as you would go into the study once again, you could work on the Sabbath day. Lord, be near our turn. Open up all the things that he needs to see in the light of Scripture to teach us here in this place. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this little church here in the Pray, Lord, for this village, that, Lord, as uh, the word goes forth here from this pulpit, Lord, that they may even tune in on the net and hear your word. And, Lord, we pray that you would open up our hearts to come even in here and out in this place of worship and join with us in the praise of our God. Father, we thank you for the work that goes on here in that present. And as we resume uh, many of our things after the summer break, we think of our Sabbath school and our CY. And God, we pray now for each of the teachers that you would help us now to prepare well for the Sabbath day. Help us to teach the young children your precious word. Help them to remember it. And we pray to God that in the early days of youth, they might respond to it in saving faith and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Heavenly Father, how we pray for this village and for all who are in it with young Lord. Be merciful to them. Our Heavenly Father, as we plan on our uh, year ahead, especially the, the elections which we will have in the not too distant future. We pray, O oh God, that you would raise up men in this place to become elders and deacons, 
Lord, that this place would be of that on the man. Lord, grant us thy hand in the coming days. Lord, as we renew our covenant, renew our with thee, we pray, O oh God, that you would help us to see exactly what we will be saying. Lord, that this is binding even in the years to come. So, O oh God, hear these our prayers. Continue to bless us and depart one from the other. And again, forgive us our many sins and our fears. And pray the name of the blood of Jesus Christ. For our sins, this may be pray. Amen. Receive now the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Amen.